we're asking what it takes in a high-speed world to be the fastest, to be the best, to be a winner. Why is it that some people can go faster than others? To find out, I'll be playing tennis against the world's fastest server. Very loud. Oh, no. I'll be trying to drive a world championship rally car. Uh, uh. And I'll be going for a spin, literally, with Britain's top test pilot. Uh. And then, hopefully, we'll know why some people are born to be spectators and why others are born to make a spectacle. In the Speed Elite, this man is it. Michael Schumacher is paid £67,000 a day for his talent. To get to know one another, I invited him to take me for a little drive in the country. You're driving really fast now. Well, it feels quite fast to me. I'd like to see you go around that corner faster than that. This is interesting. Michael and I both have the same number of eyes and lungs and nostrils, and yet he can drive so much faster than me. Why? Is there any part of your talent you don't understand? Yeah, basically, why do I have this gift? I don't know why. I mean, that's, that's simply there, but I have no explanation for it. So I set off to find out. Is it just a question of practice? What is it that we learn as we try to go faster? As you're approaching, looking over to your right for your traffic. This is Mitch. He's only had a couple of driving lessons and his brain is completely overloaded. Look at him. He's terrified. Be aware of it, but just keep going in this lane that you're in. And we can see the evidence of this terror if we fit him with a Dalek head extension, which tracks his eye movements. The little dot shows precisely what he's looking at, which is not much. He's fixated on a point exactly 30 feet in front of the car. He can't talk, he can't think. It's taking all his concentration just to go in a straight line. Practice, however, changes things considerably. Former World Rally Champion Colin McRae has had so much practice at driving, he can even do it while performing a river dance routine with his feet. His subconscious brain is doing the driving, leaving his conscious brain free to concentrate on how he can go faster and where he's going next. But hold on a minute. If experience and practice is all that matters, then I should be able to thrash the pants off Colin. I mean, I've been driving since before he was born. He is a... Whippersnapper. Um, do you mind? Do you mind just stepping out, please? Let, uh, let me show you how it should be done by someone who's older and clever and a little more seasoned and uh, get yourself a haircut. Very good chap. Let's see how long this lasts. Oh, bollocks. <laughs> have made me so good that you could almost mistake me for Sterling Moss's secret love child. See how I hook the car into the curb there and feel the tail coming out. Whoa. No big deal. Really no big deal at all. Just a little dab of the handbrake to get around this one, all right? Yes, there we go. Your Majesty. No, oh no, oh no, no, no. Oh no. Oh dear. I've gone off, everybody. <coughs> it's shaken up, just gotta 
damaged ego, I think. Oh, God. I am puzzled, though. How come I've ended up in a ditch, in a bush, with a busted-up car? How come, with all the experience I have of fast driving, I can't do what Colin McRae can? Perhaps it's because I have the reactions of a large government department. So let's test them. Greg Rosetsky is the fastest man in tennis today, and we've all wondered what it would be like to face one of his 150-mile-an-hour bullets. Well, I'm about to find out. 15, love. Oh, dear. 30, love. Ugh. 40, love. Not funny. All you're aware of is a faint ah. yellow blur. Oh! Obviously, hitting them back is impossible. One luck. Thanks very much, Greg. That was uh, disappointing. Well, better luck next time. Yeah. So how come then that this chap, Brad Langrad, who's Greg's coach, can get them back? Ah. Well, to find out, I asked Dave Collins, who's a professor of sports science. Ah. He must ah. have unbelievable reactions. No, they'd be pretty much the same as yours. No, he's yeah. getting the balls back. I didn't get them back. Hey, look, I'll, I'll prove it. Try this. Put your fingers under the bottom of the ruler. Yeah. And when I drop it, you just try and grab it as quick as you can. It'll give us a simple measure of your reactions. OK. You ready? Yeah. Seven inches. Yeah. Seven inches. Try it with him. OK, Brad, can we just borrow you? Just try this, OK? You put your fingers on either side. When I drop it, you grab it as quick as you can. You ready? Yep. Let's have a look. Hold on. Let's have a look. Where are you? Seven inches? Yep. So we've got the same reaction time. Something as simple as this, you're identical. Everybody? Yep. So that means I've got the same reaction times as Michael Schumacher? Yep, absolutely. You have to play slapsies? <laughs> yeah, we can. Go on, then. <laughs> Let's just see if I've got the same reaction times as you have. Thanks. You know how to do this? I guess, yeah. You want to go first? After you. Ha! One nil. No, I am. Oh, it's your turn, OK. Yeah, you missed it. Isn't it like this? All right. Softly! <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, that was only a fingernail, that one. <laughs> okay, let me just try it with you. Okay, watch you, my okay. eyes. I'd call that a draw. So it's true. <laughs> we all have the same basic reaction times. You, me, Michael Schumacher, Bruce Forsyth, everyone. So now we have a puzzle. I mean, it takes 450 milliseconds for one of Greg's serves to cover the length of the court. Ah! and no human being could possibly react in that time. Ah! So how come some people can get a Rosetsky serve back? Because they're looking at clues that occur before the moment that the racket and the ball make contact. What, they're reacting before he hits it? Yeah. For example, the tennis player doesn't look at the ball so much as he or she's picking up clues in the stance of the server, uh, how high the ball's tossed, or maybe he bends his back a bit more or his foot comes up higher. All these give them extra clues as to where the ball's going to go so that it looks like you react faster. This explains a few things about Colin McRae. He sees ruts and stones and slippery bits and reacts to the effect they'll have on his car before he runs over them. But if that's not down entirely to practice, how does he do it? Well, for rally driving, Colin's got a really well-wired head. It's the way the brain's put together. So here's you driving along the track. There's the tree, there's the corner, there's the bend. One thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. And there's McRae's brain doing all three or 33 things all at once. There's so much information coming from the navigator. You could be listening to a corner, which is three corners in front of where you are. So you've got to get that all in place in your mind and drive the car at the same time. You've got a brain like a pocket calculator. It can do two plus two quite quick. 
McRae's got a brain in this respect like a supercomputer. So you're saying Colin McRae's got a bigger brain than me? <laughs> that is a worry. <laughs> <laughs> It's an even bigger worry for the RAF. I mean, if I turned up and asked to be a fighter pilot, they'd spend three years and three million pounds training me. And at the end of all that, I'd still be useless. In the olden days, choosing a pilot used to be so very easy. I have here a copy of The Lancet, the medical journal from 1917, which was just about when the RAF was being founded. And it said that there should be a certain atmosphere about the man. He should be a public schoolboy, used to an open-air life, not a clerk. He should be a cavalryman or a jockey or a hunting man, and that he should have a riotous evening at least twice a month. Things, however, have changed. Crazy clam on the roll. Nowadays, they get a bunch of new recruits like this and have to work out which ones are pocket calculators and which ones are supercomputers. And that has to be done before they're put in a plane. It has to be done on the ground. Amazingly, to test a potential pilot's hand-eye coordination, they use this machine, which was designed in the 1930s to test London bus drivers. What you have to do is turn this wheel here so that you drive over as many of the little dots as you possibly can. Only 40% of applicants actually pass this test, but as you can see, I'm Baron Von Richthofen, Douglas, Barder, Cruz, Tom. Look at this, it's mainly, I missed one, I'm stunning. Whoops. So, I've got good hand-eye coordination, but then who cares? because modern planes are flown by computers. The modern pilot, therefore, needs to be someone who can operate those computers while map reading, looking for targets, and being shot at. When you're ready, press the right blue key. There's three vertical coloured lines. To see if you're good enough, there's now a test set by squadron leader Dick Woodhead. You can only cancel. The job is to cancel the objects, but you can only do it when they're hidden completely in their own coloured stripe by, by hitting the appropriate coloured key. Oh, I see. So this red one comes along. Hit the red key. You and then they hit the you yellow scored key. A point. Yellow, green. Very simple. Yellow key, green key. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Now, in among doing that... Yes, easy. Easy peasy. Yeah. It's going to ask you to do some sums. Three, and, three times three, yes. So you use 47. the number key, number key to enter the answer. This is the more things coming. Hold yeah, on, yeah, yeah. It's just a minute. <laughs> Every so often, the computer is going to ask you to recognise a string of letters. Um, well, all of those. Keeping cancelling your colours. I am. Oh, dearie me. It seems that a public school education is of no help anymore. To do this, you need to be able to rub your head, pat your tummy and solve complex mathematical equations. Look at the speed of that red one! All at the same time. PHF R... P-H-F-R-G it was, and there's only X-J. No, I missed it. It's a test that will discriminate between the very good and the average and the very bad. Three times three equals... Try nine. <laughs> Try nine. We're a green and a yellow and nine. Where is a nine? There's... Wait. No! <laughs> Two, one, now. Yellow. You got it, right. What's that 455 doing? Well, that's what you put in just now. Why the hell is the speed of the yellow one? How are you yeah. supposed to stop that? I'm, I forgot to look at the letters. It means Z, 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 Z. Each of those tasks is actually very simple on its own. What it's trying to find out about you is can you sort out which one to do when? Is there an ejector seat handle on In a supersonic yeah. world, this ability to deal with several things all at once is the key. It turns out, doesn't it, that the best people at this are women. They tend to be better at this sort of multiple... It's on again. ...tasking and, and be able to do... Stay calm. ...concentrate. Four times four is 16. I'll get to that in a minute. ...and prioritise among, among different things rather better, yes. 
I got the lowest score ever recorded, but lots of people can multi-skill, lots of people become fighter pilots, but only a handful can cope when this kind of thing happens. This Jaguar is in a spin, completely out of control. Jet fuel is burping out of the front of the engines. It's falling like a 50-ton sycamore leaf. Most pilots would simply eject, but some will try to regain control. So what kind of mad, arrogant speed freak are we talking about here? Well, to find out, I've come to the only place in the world that teaches pilots how to get a spinning fighter back in control. Forget Top Gun. This is way beyond that. This is the Empire Test Pilot School in Wiltshire. These flyboys who've come from air forces all over the world are the best of the best. But today I'm going to be taken up by one of their instructors, someone who teaches them to be even better. So who's the superhero then? Nope. It's the little bald Welsh bloke, squadron leader Rhys Williams. OK, Jeremy, so what we're going to do is we're going to be about 42,000 feet. I'm going to pull the stick fully back, stall the aircraft. I'm going to kick full rudder and then we're going to be departed into the spin and Crashing. we will be spinning. Uh, hopefully we're not going to crash. We may well be in the vertical and then we're going to recover to about 25,000 feet. Right. <laughs> That'll be fun then. It won't. You're spinning, are you? Yeah. Oh, nice. I wouldn't want to go spinning. <laughs> really? No, I would not. Have you done this spinning? Yes. Is it unpleasant? <laughs> Will I be sick? Um, there's a possibility. It doesn't fit. It's, I can't go. There's no can't helmet. You? No, it's just not big enough. Perhaps you haven't prized it open enough. That's a shame. Still, never mind. No, uh, no, we've got another one. Sit down, please. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ed. Is it ready? It certainly is. Let's have a look. Well, this is it. Do you just sign a plane out? Yeah, like I do. Well, first we check that it's, uh, it's serviceable. It's got all the right bits on it. Unlikely, since this is the plane we'll be using. It's a Hunter. It's 43 years old, and yup, that yellow stuff on the wing is Araldite. So, Air brake, 15% micro switch not working. Not to be used on the ground. No anti-G system available. Cockpit too stiff to operate. We sorted those out. And that's this week. Please, God, let Reese be as good a pilot as everyone says he is. Any time I'm not happy, I'll tell you, I'll say eject, eject, eject. Don't be there on the third one. No, I wasn't planning to be there on the eject of the first one, actually. Ready? Nice wheel. Off. Oh. At 41,000 feet, the terror would begin. Reese would start the most extreme manoeuvre you can do in a plane. Oh, look, there's a wheel where we now, Bristol Channel. Turn him on the sea. Fuel is good, engine is good, mechanisation is holding up. Just as long as the tail plane doesn't come off. TM, 15 seconds. What? Okay, 15 seconds. Oh no. 3, 2, 1, now. Oh, that's hit me. No, no, no. Oh, oh, oh. 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 However frightening you think this looks, take it from me, in the cockpit, it's a thousand times worse. And yet Reese wasn't just sitting there grunting. He was working the problem, sorting it out, saving our lives. That's good. No hesitation there. OK, steepening now, you see. Two turns. And we still try to the props. Has gone the other way. And doesn't want to go. Oh, it's going. Oh, 
So what have we learned about the ultimate speed freaks then? We know that reactions have nothing to do with it. We know that practice helps. No. Oh, no, no, no. But it isn't the answer. We know they can do several things all at once. <laughs> and now we've discovered with Reese that they can stay calm and unemotional even when the whole world is going to hell in a handcart. <laughs> I was destroyed by my flight, which made me wonder. People like Reese, have they got a special mindset? Are they born to put the hammer down while the rest of us throw up? Are you, do you lead a, an amazing life then away from this? Do you have to? I think surprisingly boring, probably. Really? Um, so what do you do then of an evening? Uh, maybe take the dog for a walk or uh, go out with my children. What car do you drive? A Volvo Estate. Why? Because it's safe. It's very reliable. And no, also... Don't, you don't drive a safe car. You do that for a living and you drive a safe car. I've always thought speed freaks were like Tom Cruise with bikes, not Volvo estates. But now I come to think of it, most of the Formula One drivers I've met could bore a man to death at 400 paces. Does this mean then, to go really fast, you have to be a little bit dull? Or is there more to it? Well, someone who spent 40 years analysing the speed elite is American psychologist Keith Jonsgaard. The profile that we see for race car drivers on jet fighter pilots are very, very similar, very different than uh, people in general and very different from people who engage in team sports. The pattern of their personality is kind of mildly psychopathic. They're sort of like uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, in the spaghetti westerns, cool, reserved, tough guy that doesn't get involved rides off into the sunset. Yeah, it's true. Do you ever get excited by anything? I do. But uh, it needs a lot to get me excited. If I see my heart rate while I'm racing, it's pretty low. It's probably lower than what your, your one is right now. They're extraordinarily bright. Probably brighter than 85, 90% of the population. I'm clever at the things that interest me. I'm, I'm very focused. Their greatest need is to be the best. They, they want to excel. On this basis then, Michael Schumacher is a typical Formula One driver. But the man who talks to him on the radio during races, Ferrari Supremo Ross Braun, thinks he's anything but typical. Certainly to my mind, he's the best driver uh, in Formula One at the moment. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So what then is Schumacher's magic ingredient? Michael Schumacher has been left at the start. At the Spanish Grand Prix a few years ago, he got to the first corner in sixth place, and then he proceeded to show the world why he earns £67,000 a day. You very often see that in the wet, because in the wet, the car has a lot less grip. And that's where you need to get closer to the limit. That's where the skill really shows. A corner will last two or three seconds, and he can be making five or six corrections during that two or three seconds. If he's a tenth of a second too slow, the car will be out of control. Just watch the way his car shimmies. He's coming around these corners. He's driving the car almost over the limit, but he's bringing it back with each correction. Maybe he goes in a little bit too quick, he brings it back again, tries to push it again, brings it back again. 
The staggering thing about Michael is that he can function as a Formula One racing driver, and then he has his spare capacity on top of that to think about the race, to think about uh, what's going on around him. Sometimes they'll come on the radio, it's like you and I having this conversation. You would think he was sat next to you, not doing anything. On the contrary, I've worked with drivers and it's, <laughs> you know, they're just about coping with what they're doing. There's no spare capacity. And that's the difference between him and other mortals. How can you feel that you've gone around a corner faster? What does it feel like? You feel the car on the edge. What does that feel like? You, you have the feeling for the optimum. It's a knowledge I, I have when, when the car is maximum. And Schumacher is there with a clear track ahead of him by nipping through on the inside. And you can feel that. You can feel oh, in the car. You're you half a one. mile an hour faster yeah. and you're going to crash. I'd say it's probably a thousand of a second. And Michael Schumacher wins the Spanish Grand Prix. Frankly, Michael made the rest of the field look like monkeys. Now, part of that's down to his calmness, his experience, his well-wired head, but also it's down to the final feature that racing drivers must have if they want to win. They feel a lot less guilt than most of us. And on that front, Michael Schumacher is the absolute king. In 1997, Jacques Villeneuve in the blue car had to beat him to win the championship. So Michael, as the replay shows, tried to ram him off the track. Jacques Villeneuve, and you bumped into him. Did you have guilt about that? No, not really guilt. I've been growing up with Senna and remember incidents with Prost and Senna. Go! Ayrton Senna was the greatest racing driver of the generation before Schumacher, and he too would ram people off the track if he thought it necessary. This is amazing! Senna goes off! And that makes Ayrton Senna world champion this year. That's why I don't, don't have the feeling I'm guilty for anything, because it's part of, uh, it was part of the game. I knew it wasn't right, but this is an important moment, everything or nothing, and you go for it. So that's it. To be the fastest, to be the best, to be a winner, you do what needs to be done, and to hell with the consequences. The thing is, I'm just worried that I'm not a racing driver and it's actually psychological. Is that, is that possible, do you think? Could very well be. Are, are you someone who has a tremendous need to win? No, I quite like to win chess, but I, I do think that it's better to lose in some ways because it's so much easier to pull the right face if you win. And it's very difficult to get your face right. You know, if you lose, you just go, you know, silly old me, <laughs> I lost. And that's quite an easy face to pull. That's why I quite like losing. Oh, my goodness. You don't sound at all like a racing car driver. Not really? No. Next week, I'll be trying to understand how we survive our love of speed. I'll be fighting the G-forces in the world's biggest salad spinner. I go to war. Shut up, woman. With a backseat driver in the world's best fighter plane. And I'll try something that's never been done before. Driving down a ski slope at 80 miles an hour.